Good morning, this is Dr. Nick Tulo, streaming live from New Jersey here at the ECG Academy. I just wanted to thank all of you for joining me this morning at the Saturday at 10 o'clock here in, on the Eastern Standard Time. And I already have a few people from joining from the UK and uh, Nicola, good morning, and Tom, David, Zahid, thank you so much. And, and Dec from Somalia, thank you. This is great. I mean, you guys are great, except I've been, it's been a really busy week for me. I mean, for those of you who don't know, I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist. I practice in New Jersey and it's been a crazy week. I'm still renovating the house. And uh, as you can see, I don't have like the second camera set up. So, you know, this is uh, still kind of a basic live stream. And I'm using the camera on my new iMac, so it's not the best. But anyway, that's uh, if you haven't seen any glitches or anything else going on, you know, please let me know. Uh, <laughs> David and Holly, I mean, thank you very much. Uh, so, you know, those of you who uh, who enjoy reading ECGs and want to get better at it, that's why I created ECG Academy. And um, I mean, you can find information in the link down at the description. You can click on it and learn more about it. But these Saturday morning live streams were uh, designed to be more clinical because, uh, yeah, you can read books about how to read an ECG and you can, of course, watch my video tutorials. But when it comes to treating real patients, this is what I wanted to do is give you guys some insight into how a heart rhythm specialist looks at patients and how we treat things. And this was a very interesting case. You know, it's one of those chicken and the egg thing. I'm starting to try to put the graphics together for my, uh, for, for, for my little uh, 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 graphic that you get on, on YouTube. But um, this was a patient who has a history of coronary disease uh, and they presented with uh, atrial fibrillation, but they also had heart failure. So let's get to the case and, um, and you guys can, can answer questions as we go. Hey, good morning, Brian. <laughs> How are you? Okay, so let's see if we can get my case up here. Here we go. So this was an 82 year old retired professor. Hello. So uh, those of you in the UK, you, I'm sure you'll comment on how terrible my English accent is. He had a stent 18 years ago and um, was otherwise stable and he had preserved left ventricular function. So his EF was in the range of like 55% or so and he had been doing well for many years. He was on, I think an ARB Lasartan for hypertension and it was also on 25 milligrams of metoprolol twice a day and a baby aspirin. But uh, four weeks ago, he started to not sleep well. He felt congested in his head. He felt sort of short of breath. He wasn't sleeping well, was waking up a lot in the middle of the night. And so he finally came to the office two weeks ago. And two weeks ago, he was found to have atrial fibrillation um, and this, I'm going to show you the cardiogram, uh, from, well, actually, no, I'm not going to show you the cardiogram from two weeks ago, but suffice it to say at atrial fibrillation and his heart rate was about 130 beats per minute. So immediately they said, okay, well, you know, you can't live like this. We're going to increase your metoprolol. And so it was increased to 50 milligrams BID to address the rapid heart rate. His blood pressure was a little on the high side, if anything. Uh, in the 140s. And he was also started on Xarelto in anticipation that, okay, well, why, why would you start Xarelto? You have to look at uh, all patients with um, the idea that they're going to have an increased risk of stroke if they have atrial fibrillation. But we use the CHADS VASC score in order to give it a better idea of which patients are at relatively low risk and which patients are at much higher risk. So he got two points for being over age 75. He gets a point for having hypertension. He has a point for having coronary artery disease. So that was enough for us to say he needs to be on anticoagulation long term. So we started on Xarelto. But then how many of you would have just been happy to do that? I mean, um, you know, are you going to leave him in atrial fibrillation forever? That's one of the things you have to think about when you have a patient with relatively recent onset atrial fibrillation. Are you going to kind of do a rate control and anticoagulation strategy 
uh, that would be more conservative, or are you going to think about cardioverting the patient back into a normal sinus rhythm? And a lot of it depends on their heart function and their symptoms. So we did an echocardiogram in the office, and it turns out that his ejection fraction seemed to be less than it had been. It had been running like 50, 55%, and the office was more like 40%. So we were a little concerned and so um, decided that we were going to eventually cardiovert this patient, but uh, he needed to be on Xarelto first. And then he presented to the emergency room with increasing dyspnea, uh, was having difficulty lying flat. He was getting short of breath with minimal exertion. And so we did, um, let me get rid of the history here and show you the um, cardiogram. And let me get rid of this thing here. So get rid of this. And here's his cardiogram in the emergency room. So let's kind of go over this because it's got a few abnormalities in it. This is one of those, um, what I call uh, <clears throat> um, uh, ECGs, uh, uh, 12, <laughs> uh, crazy 12 leads with multiple abnormalities. This is kind of like one of my final exams. So anyway, we have um, an irregularly irregular rhythm. It's not terribly fast since he went on the metoprolol. His heart rate here is averaging probably about 100, 110 beats per minute. Uh, we, can, we can probably measure it if we count up. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's about six seconds. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So yeah, it's about 110 beats a minute, more or less. That's an average way of doing it. And looking for P waves in front of QRS complexes, we don't see them. We see sort of more of a disorganized, very fine jiggly pattern. This kind of is what you'd expect with atrial fibrillation. What else do we see? Good morning. <laughs> Space Fed, thanks, uh, uh, th thanks for Malaysia. Thanks for my new setting. You should see the, the rest of it. Actually, when I get the second camera set up, you'll see it's really kind of cool. Uh, so what, um, what, are, what are we looking at here? Look at the limb leads and can you tell what the axis is? Uh, so look at all six limb leads and see which one is most isoelectric. It looks like AVR. And it's negative in 2, 3, and F, so it's going away from the feet. And remember, AVR is a very strange lead to be isoelectric because it means that you're kind of, uh, you know, in a very abnormal part of the circle. Here's AVR, 30 degrees above the horizontal. That means your axis is going to be either minus 60 or it's going to be plus 120. So you either have... You may have an anterior or posterior hemiblock. In this case, since it's going away from 2, 3, and F, it has to be minus 60. And then the first thing you want to do is look to see if there's an R wave in the inferior leads. And there is. There are little tiny R waves there. So that tells us you have a left anterior hemiblock. Why do you look for R waves? Because, good afternoon, Richard. Thanks for joining me. If you have Q waves in the inferior leads, that tells you that you're dealing with an old inferior MI. And in that case, the marked left axis deviation could be explained just from the absence of inferior forces. But now, since you don't have an old inferior MI, it gives us a diagnosis of left anterior hemiblock. And when we look at the precordial leads, we also see very, very poor R wave progression. There's hardly any R wave until you get out to V5. You do have a typical yeah, well, um, you know, you, the, the, the wide S wave here is sort of suggestive of a right bundle, but you don't have the R prime in V1. So it's more of a nonspecific IVCD. Uh, but certainly uh, most people would look at this and say, hmm, possible anterior MI. Uh, but it's also very common for people to have poor R wave progression or so-called late transition when you have an anterior hemiblock. So at any rate, the ECG, there were no acute changes. I mean, you have sort of expected T wave abnormalities that go in the opposite direction of the QRS, which would go along with an IVCD or some other conduction uh, delay. 
but there weren't any ST elevations. It didn't look like an acute MI. But let's get to the important part. Let's take a look at his, um, uh, his echo. So here's an, um, his echo, and I'm going to play that for you. Um, so for those of you who read echoes, you probably can tell what this is, but um, this is known as a four chamber view. So you have, uh, let me see if I can write on this. Yeah, I can't write on it, but you have, I think you can see my cursor. This is the left ventricle and this is the right ventricle. This is the left atrium and this is the right atrium. And so your mitral valve is opening and closing here. But what you see really is that the left ventricle is large and it's not really contracting very well. You have a very decreased ejection fraction here. And, and we've got a couple of other views here. I'm going to show you this other view, which is known as a parasternal long axis view. Look at how the, now here you have the right ventricle up top, which is close to the anterior chest wall. This is the left ventricular cavity. And if you look at the, here's the posterior wall, it's contracting, but not very well. The septal wall is contracting, it's thickening, but very, very poorly. The ejection fraction here was read as 20 to 25%. And I'll give you another, one more view. This is a short axis view. So we're actually slicing the heart uh, in, in half. So we are kind of like looking at the profile of the heart. And let me run that for you. So this is a very chunky looking um, papillary muscle, I think. Uh, this is the right ventricle and this is the left ventricle. Now you can see that it's really not contracting very vigorously and the ejection fraction is markedly diminished here. So, so here we're left with a guy who has symptoms of heart failure. In a physical exam, he had roused bilaterally and <laughs> Uh, Jamshid says dilated LV and LA decreased uh, absolutely low EF. You got it right on the money. The guy has a cardiomyopathy. Now, the question is, what came first? Did he develop a cardiomyopathy and then the increased left ventricular and diastolic pressure was transmitted to the left atrium? You get left atrial stretch and then you develop atrial fibrillation, or did he develop atrial fibrillation four weeks ago and because of the rapid rate develop kind of a tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy? And that's, that's a very difficult question to answer because we kind of don't know what the time course of the, of the F LV dysfunction was. If we had an echo four weeks ago, we might have a better idea. So, now, we did evaluate his coronaries. We did a Lexi scan, and there was no evidence of ischemia, but there was evidence of a large anterior scar, which might explain why he had this poor R wave progression. Okay, so to sum it up, we have a guy who was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation and a rapid ventricular response two weeks ago, was placed on Xarelto, now is having worsening heart failure, and his left ventricular function is deteriorating. It was four weeks ago. It was 40 two weeks ago, and now it's down to 20 to 25%. So what would you do? Any suggestions? What, I mean, what, would, you, what would you do with his medications? Um, do, you, do, you guys, do you guys think he's on the right meds at this point? I mean, he's on Xarelto, which is great, so he should be safe from having a stroke. Would you just go ahead and cardiovert him at this point? Uh, he, he's been on, remember, he's been on Xarelto for two whole weeks. Is that enough? Is that long enough to do a cardioversion without worrying that he might have a, a, a clot? And the answer is no. Uh, I would not try to cardiovert this patient at this point because the rule is if you're going to plan to cardiovert somebody, he, they have to have at least three weeks of full anticoagulation. And Xarelto is fine. Uh, any of the NOACs would be appropriate, but you wouldn't go ahead and cardiovert him without making sure he doesn't have a clot. So it's, um, if LA is very dilated, cardioversion is unlikely to work. Well, Nicola, you have a point. It's not massively dilated like you would have with, you know, severe mitral valvular disease. And although he's 82, in my practice, 
I'd like to give people a, a shot. I like to give people a chance of, of getting back into normal sinus rhythm, especially since it's, it's conceivable that he went into atrial fibrillation four weeks ago or six weeks ago. He really didn't complain of palpitations, so we don't really know when it started. And maybe the rapid heart rate is what caused his left ventricular function to deteriorate. So I wouldn't be happy just leaving him at atrial fibrillation. True, the chances of recurrence are very high, but um, I, that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Uh, some people would not. They would just, you know, control his rate or whatever. Uh, and, but I, I'm hoping that some of his left ventricular dysfunction potentially could be reversible if we get his heart rate back, back to normal. So we have a lot of comments here. Three weeks anticoagulation, Richard, you are absolutely right, or TE got a procedure. And he mentions amiodarone. Well, we thought about amiodarone. We thought about antiarrhythmic drugs in general. So would you just start him on amiodarone now? See, antiarrhythmic drugs have the potential for chemically cardioverting the patient. What if he has this big globby clot in his left atrial appendage? I wouldn't want to give him amiodarone at this point in time unless I knew that he didn't have a clot. I think the only antiarrhythmic drug that we use of all the class 1s, 1As, 1Cs, uh, and the class 3s, the only one that pretty much does not acutely cardiovert people is Sotolol. I mean, I mean, that's what's written in the literature, that you don't use Sotolol to convert somebody, although it it's helpful to keep people in sinus rhythm. But I would be reluctant to start him on amiodarone right off the bat without knowing that he didn't have a clot. But I think given his poor ejection fraction, your choices of antiarrhythmic drugs are limited. And uh, you know, as, um, uh, as Nicola mentioned, his chances of recurrent atrial fibrillation after cardioversion are very high. So you don't, wouldn't just cardiovert him and then send him off on his merry way and say, oh, all right, you're, you'll be fine now. You really have to put him on something that's going to help maintain a normal rhythm. So when you have recent heart failure and a poor ejection fraction, honestly, amiodarone is the only drug that would be helpful. The only other drug that might be helpful would be dofetilide which is Ticacin in the, in the U.S. Um, but, even, but that wouldn't help control his ventricular response. That doesn't have any effect on AV nodes. So uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily use Ticacin. Uh, you wouldn't use Multac or um, uh, Dronetarone because that's been shown to have serious issues with people with recent heart failure. And you can't use any of the 1C agents or, or 1As really. So, so Alexander, um, Dofetilide, I would tend to stay away from it only because he, he does have a rapid ventricular response. And, um, you know, I think amiodarone would be more effective and, and he's 82. So um, you want to give him the best chance of staying in a normal rhythm. Now, let's say you can get a cardiovertum and you have him on amiodarone and he's doing really well for three months. You know, you could potentially stop the amiodarone and then perhaps switch him over to dofetilide. But at any rate, how would you find out if he has a clot? Um, that's, that's what the TEE is for. And that's exactly what we decided to do. But what about his medications? No one's mentioned the metoprolol. See, I'm not a big fan of metoprolol because it's a pure beta blocker. So which that, that means that you get unopposed alpha stimulation at the periphery. And that, that's why conventional beta blockers make Raynaud's worse is because they cause vasoconstriction. When you have left ventricular dysfunction and you want to decrease the afterload, you want to bring the blood pressure down to increase cardiac output, metoprolol might not be the best drug to use because it decreases LV contractility and it constricts your blood vessels. So I decided to switch him from metoprolol to carvedilol. So I think carvedilol is a much better drug to use in people who have heart failure. And that was the first thing that I did. Uh, the, the, 
the the heart rate was you know wasn't poorly controlled with that. But then the, the second thing, after we made sure that he didn't have any acute ischemia, and I don't think a, an angiogram would, would be terribly helpful unless his Lexi-scan nuclear stress test had shown a suggestion of ischemia. But the next thing that we did was a TEE and a cardioversion. Um, Kiwat, you got it, carvedilol, that's what we did. And so how long does it take to get cardiomyopathy? I don't really know what the exact time course could be, but I think four weeks of, we don't really know when the AFib started. I mean, for all we know, he could have been in atrial fibrillation for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, and I think that when you, you're starting out with um, some history of ischemic heart disease and hypertension, I think maybe in some patients that process gets accelerated when you're when you go into rapid AFib. So anyway, ACE MRA Carvedilol. So um, here was an image from his TEE. Let me show it to you, and I'll play that. So you can see how absolutely miserable, this is his left ventricle, just terrible, terrible LV function. They're talking about 20% maybe. But his, this is a left atrium and it was crystal clear. It was pristine. There were no clots at all in the left atrium or in the left atrial appendage. So we went ahead and did the cardioversion and it was actually successful. So here's the ECG after the cardioversion. Or what do we see? Let's kind of go over this for a second. Because after all, we're learning ECGs here. So we now have, uh, where's my cursor? Mm -hmm. So now we do see P waves in front of every QRS complex. Uh, this one looks smaller, but this QRS maybe looks a little bit early. Uh, that, yeah, well, okay, maybe, maybe this is just a... Um, uh, a little bit of sinus arrhythmia because the P wave is only slightly different. What was this beat? What's this FLB here? Funny looking beat. There's a P wave in front of it, but the PR interval is very short and the QRS looks very different than the underlying beat. So I think this is just a PVC. But he still has the marked left axis deviation. So he still has left anterior hemi block with little R waves in the inferior leads. And in this tracing, he really has very poor R wave progression. And it's not like he has a D best wave in V5 and V6. You know, when I see anterior hemi block, frequently what happens is you have late transitions. So you get persistent S waves in V5 and, and V6 that to me are more conduction problems and late transition based on the hemi block. But in this case, we don't really have that. We have very small S waves <clears throat> in V6. So I know I would read this as an old anterior MI. So um, now that we have him back in sinus, oh, by the way, he has uh, P mitrali. If you guys notice, there's a very large double bump and the two bumps are separated by f more than 40 milliseconds. So that goes along with left atrial enlargement. Even though he doesn't have a big negative S wave in V1, I'd still call left atrial enlargement here. And he does have some nonspecific T wave abnormalities. Uh, so, uh, but they're similar to what they were before the cardioversion. <clears throat> Drutan, <laughs> Thank, thanks. Uh, you're a, a, a cardiac anesthesi anesthesiologist. We, I, I don't, I think, um, as far as digoxin is concerned, that's not a bad idea in this particular patient because digoxin can improve left ventricular function. And in someone with rapid atrial fibrillation, it might be as an adjunct be helpful in reducing the ventricular response. Um, now that he's back in sinus rhythm, would you use digoxin to just help his LV function? Some people would. And in an 82-year-old, a lot of people would shy away from it because of the risk of toxicity. 
But that's a good idea. We know that digoxin doesn't help people live longer, but it might reduce some of the symptoms of heart failure. So uh, that, that would be something to consider as well. But once he got cardioverted, the first thing I did was put him on amiodarone. And I gave him a loading dose because I wanted his levels to get up there. So I actually put him on uh, 400 milligrams three times a day with meals. So we know that amiodarone gets absorbed better when you take it with food. So I gave him 400 milligrams three times a day with meals. We have him on Coreg 12 and a half milligrams twice a day. We have him on an ARB and I left him on some PO Lasix to keep his heart failure from reaccumulating. And after two days, he remained in sinus rhythm and we actually discharged him yesterday. So we'll see. Um, now, when you look at an injection fraction of 20%, you think, oh, maybe he needs, maybe he's at risk of sudden death. Maybe he needs an implantable defibrillator. And how many people would put an implantable defibrillator at, at this point in time? Um, how much joule would you suggest for first time for chronic AFib on amiodarone on a cardiovert by biophasic defibrillator? I, that, that's a good question. And I tend to use very low energies. So if somebody's very thin, I will often go with 50 joules, 70, 100. If someone's much larger, I will start with 100. And then if that doesn't work, I'll go to 200. If that doesn't work, then I'll move my patch position because I always put my front patch over the right, right atrium. So right of, on the right side of the sternum and the back patch is by, behind the left atrium. So I'm sort of like, um, I have my patches sort of diagonally. So you have both atria between the two patches. But if 200 joules biphasic doesn't work, then I'll move the anterior patch to the left side so that you have um, less space and less Im electrical impedance, electrical resistance between the two patches. Sometimes you can get a higher current through the heart, especially if somebody has a very large left atrium. And then if that doesn't work, sometimes they'll move the patches up or down because unless you have like fluor fluoroscopy, you might not be exactly over the heart. So I, I don't give up on cardioversion. I have like a 99% success rate with, with cardioversion. The only problem is the, um, uh, the, 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 what was I going to say? Um, um, the problem is that sometimes you'll cardiovert somebody and within a few seconds, they'll go back into atrial fibrillation again. You'll have a couple of sinus beats and then they'll go back into AFib. So that's known as IRAF or immediate recurrence of atrial fibrillation. Uh, so in, in those patients, you have to make sure that they're on an antiarrhythmic drug and sometimes you might decide to give them a bolus of something um, and then try again. Or sometimes you have to load them up with a drug, send them home and bring them back to try again. So I would wait six to eight weeks, Richard. Yes, I, I totally agree. I would wait six to eight weeks and then look at the left, vent left ventricular function, look at the EF to see if we can get it back up to in the 40% range. Because I'm not a, I, I, don't, I, I don't like putting defibrillators in someone who has potentially a transient reversible cause of left ventricular dysfunction. So, um, I, I would say it's debatable whether to send him home with like a life vest. I think the chances of him needing a life vest are only maybe 1%. And those things are really kind of inconvenient to wear. But a lot of people are big fans of life vests and they'd send somebody home like this with a life vest and then check their echo after six to eight weeks. And then if the ejection fraction is still low, then offer the patient an implantable defibrillator. Uh, and then if it's recovered to greater than 35%, then they're not a good candidate for an implantable device. But I, would, I left him on amiodarone on 400 milligrams three times a day as a loading dose for five days. And then I gave him instructions to cut down to 400 milligrams once a day at that point after five days of a load. You know, it's, it's sort of a high load, high dose up front, and then you kind of taper quickly. Uh, so then the question is, I guess, whether Number one, is he going to stay in sinus rhythm? Number two, is his ejection fraction going to improve? Number three, 
Will we optimizing his heart failure meds? You look at his blood pressure, maybe he needs 25 milligrams of carvedilol if his blood pressure is running, you know, in the 130s, 140s. Uh, optimize his ARB, his renal function was pretty normal. And, th and then the question is whether you want to, you put him on digoxin or whether you want to wait and see, maybe his ejection fraction will improve and uh, you won't need to go that route because there is that, that, that risk of toxicity. So uh, I, I, think, um, uh, I, I think we've explored most of what's going on. Then the question remains, what came first? I mean, since he didn't have palpitations, I think it's conceivable that the, he had underlying pro, you know, a propensity. Maybe he had uh, some LV dysfunction because his EF was only 40% four weeks ago. Um, and then with the rapid rate, I think it caused it to deteriorate, but hopefully that'll be transient and that'll get better. But we know that coronary disease, hypertension, left ventricular dysfunction, those are all risk factors for atrial fibrillation. And so it's like one feeds into the other and um, you know, that's, <laughs> we, can, we can sort of sit and guess as, as long as we want, but we'll never really know for sure, I suppose, but that's kind of the fun and the art of medicine is uh, sort of guessing, well, what, what do you think would help the most in this particular patient? And understanding the physiology and picking the right drugs. So you guys came up with, with Carvedilol, which is a fabulous idea. Uh, you, even digoxin might actually help him. Amiodarone is the drug of choice for someone with LV dysfunction. So, you know, it's great. And I, I love interacting with you guys. It's this international uh, uh, group of, of cardiac specialists um, interacting on a rainy Saturday morning here in New Jersey. It's terrific. So anyway, if you guys really like this content, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's ECG Doc. There's a link in the description where you can just click on it and you'll be subscribed. Tell all your friends and colleagues to subscribe so that when I do these things on Saturday morning, you'll get notification that I'm actually doing it. You can actually go back. This is my 25th one now. So you can go back. There's hours and hours of me rambling on about one thing or another that you might enjoy and, and learn something from. Um, and then if you want to learn more about reading ECGs, uh, like a, like a, like an electrophysiologist looks at an ECG, understanding the physiology about it, just check out ecgacademy.com. That's also in the description below. So if you guys, spironolactone, Richard, great idea. Now that I see that, I meant to, I meant to uh, mention that I did put him on that when he went home. I put him on, on 12 and a half. When he, when he first came in, his Potassium was a little on the high side, so I didn't start it right away, but that, that would be a very good idea as well, especially if he's gonna go home on Lasix. So thank you guys, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it, and hopefully I can get this together next week as well, and maybe I'll have my, um, the rest of my studio up and running. I might have a, um, a better webcam as well. But uh, until then, have a terrific week, uh, and, and, um, and enjoy it all. I mean, this is, this is kind of fun, you know, we're in a fun business and, uh, and I hope you enjoy these, these interactions. So we'll see you next week. And, uh, until then take care.